Hello everyone, uh, I'm Joe Nash. Oh no, one of my buttons is disconnected. One second. Um, someone at the back, can you press the like button? Okay, we'll sort that out later. I might not be able to get feedback. You can only dislike my talk now because the like button's disconnected. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Joe. Um, I am a functional programmer uh, from a company called Braintree. Uh, we are a payments processor. If you haven't heard of us, uh, come back to my talk at 4.20 where I'm going to be talking, which walking you through a case study of some closure and Kafka stuff, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, but right now, I'm here to do a talk which I got asked to do yesterday morning. This is not prepared in the slightest. Basically, there was a slot in not only object-oriented, and I am a not only object-oriented programmer. Um, so I decided to talk a bit about monads. And as I just told some people in this room, uh, I'm kind of interested here in, obviously, there's been lots of monad resources. There's endless tutorials. There are talks in almost every conference you go to. And people still aren't understanding monads. Raise your hand if you understand monads. Perfect. See, exactly. <laughs> How many of you have read a monad tutorial? There we go. So I'm going to kind of present it how I think it should be presented and how I think it should be taught. Obviously, I haven't prepared for this, and I don't think, I can't remember the last time I did a Monad implementation from scratch, so this might not work, but we'll give it a go. Um, and kind of what I want to see here is like, if we get to the end of it and it still doesn't make sense, I kind of want to get into a discussion about why, like where the falling points are, and see if we can kind of work those out, and then maybe in the future, at some point, this will be a talk that someone could actually learn something from. Um, so having said that, if you do want a well-prepared, really good talk on functional programming, I highly recommend you go to the Scala and Acker talk, which is also taking place right now, because those things are badass, and this is not. Cool. Um, so a little bit of background about why I should give this talk. Um, so I have a bit of a functional background from university. I was taught by a guy called Graham Hutton in the University of Nottingham. And Graham Hutton has done all sorts of amazing things with functional programming, including writing one of the textbooks. Um, and up until recently, I was a PhD student under a guy called Kevin Hammond, who wrote the original IO monad in the compiler. So hopefully, I know what a monad is. Let's, let's not go too close on that, though. Um, so there's some things I feel like I should mention. There are two laws of nature. Uh, which are unavoidable, and they're just certainties, right? They're as certain as gravity. They're, as, they're just existent. The first one is that once you learn Haskell, you will write a monad tutorial. And the second one is that once you learn monads, you lose the ability to teach anyone monads. So bearing that one in mind, <laughs> I think we'll be okay. So I also kind of want to walk people through, um, obviously this isn't Haskell only, and one of the things I'm actually kind of tempted to do is victimize a poor JavaScript programmer by bringing you up here and make you live write a monad implementation. I'm not certain if I'm going to do that yet. Um, but this isn't only Haskell applicable, but I'm going to be doing it in Haskell. So I'm going to give a brief walkthrough of the Haskell, ecos Haskell ecosystem, um, do some maybe quick trivial functions to kind of show you the syntax. Anyone a Haskell programmer? OK, cool. So that, yeah, we go. This, I could probably get at least 20 minutes out of just showing you syntax. That could be good. Still some time. Um, so we'll do that a little bit. Um, I've got some code ready for you. Um, and also, I'm going to give a little bit of a preamble uh, about some things that are kind of like preconceptions with Haskell. So I mean, I will prefix this right now with I'm not trying to evangelize Haskell for industrial use. It is being used a lot in industry. Where I come from in London, there's quite a few companies using it. Uh, one of them is a really cool pusher, for example. They're using it for some analytics stuff, which is really neat. Um, Facebook, Google, Twitter actually recently just started using it as well. Facebook have two of the people who worked on the original compiler, which is pretty dope. Um, Google have a guy called Brian O'Sullivan, who, oh no, that's Facebook again. Google have someone important. It's cool, I can't remember who. Um, there's lots of cool people doing stuff in industry right now. All the people you tend to find doing it in the big companies tend to be like very serious people, like people who have worked on the compiler, which obviously isn't a standard use case. But the point is that like Haskell is kind of getting out there. But also saying that, I was telling someone earlier that I'm actually kind of against using Haskell in industry right now, because the Haskell, if you go and search Haskell or you go on the mailing list right now, you'll kind of see we're going for our Python 2 and 3 moment. There's been a big divide in opinion over what way the basic library should be structured. And on one side, you've got the fundamentalists who are well into category theory being like, we should do this way. And on the other hand, you've got, well, that way is completely under misunderstandable for anyone without a PhD. Um, so if you do go and look and try and do any of the stuff I'm going to show you, I highly recommend, just as a quick note, do not use GHC 7.10 onwards. GHC 7.10 onwards, I won't explain why, but if you take the list of a pair, uh, if you take the length of a list of a pair of strings, it will always resolve to one, no matter how long the string is. Craziness is going on there. Look into it, it's hilarious. But so, 
I'm teaching Haskell because it's got some really neat things inside it and some really important concepts, one of which is its heavy prioritization and use of category theory. So we'll walk through category theory, we'll talk about a bit what category is, um, and we're going to build up, we're going to do, we're going to kind of go down the hierarchy. So Monad is actually the third or fourth, if you count monoid as an interesting thing, which no one does, in a hierarchy of things called categories. We're going to start by talking about uh, the ones below it, funct or unapplicative, and then we'll talk a bit about Monad. So, first of all, let's talk about Haskell. So, I think it's fair to say that Haskell has a really bad reputation as something that only academics are interested in. Oh, one thing I will quickly mention, obviously I don't have slides, and I also speak very fast. So if you are having trouble absorbing what I'm saying, I am capable of speaking at a normal speed, I'm told. You just have to tell me. So please feel free to heckle, and in fact, that's going to be a policy throughout this entire talk. If there's something you don't understand, or there's something I've said too fast, or there's something that you just look at and just go, that is plain bad shit. Call it out, and we'll talk about it. There is no format to this talk. I'm entirely winging it, so we may as well have a chat halfway through. Cool. So, uh, Haskell has a bit of a bad reputation as being just for researchers and academics, right? And this is not entirely unwarranted because it is used as a major research platform for programming language theory. If you look at a lot of the advances that have kind of made their way into mainstream programming language now, like if you look at a lot of the things in Swift, they've come out of research into languages like OCaml and languages like Haskell. As an aside, a lot of the things in Swift that Swift kind of claim, that Apple kind of claim are new and they've renamed and they've made all like, oh, this is a Swift thing. No, no, they just made a load of names around stuff that's been in Haskell since the 80s, so just saying. Um, so it's not entirely, that reputation isn't entirely unwarranted, but where Haskell originally came from was actually a working group that got together to make a functional programming language that would be rigorous and available for use in industry. This whole hijacking as a academic language has it been exactly that. It is a completely accidental hijacking. There was a research language called Miranda that was split off by this working group to make a practical functional programming language. Work on Miranda then stopped unintendedly, and they started working again on Haskell as a research platform. So Haskell got hijacked again as a research platform, which is where we get to this dispute I mentioned earlier with 7.10 uh, just being completely mental. <laughs> so there is obviously some points in Haskell where you look at it and just go, how is this useful for an industry programmer? If you encounter in those points, there is languages that are building off of things learned in Haskell, uh, like Swift, um, to be industry applicable. Two of the really interesting ones right now are Elm. Elm is brand new. Elm is really, really cool. Um, it's by a guy called Evan. Um, he basically built it as a functional reactive. If I'm going to show you, I can do this stuff. Let's just go a bit rogue. Um, so he built this language as like a uh, like the perfect reactive application web scripting language, right? And let me show you the absolutely mind-blowing thing. He has this, in fact, no, I don't want this one. I don't want this one at all. So has anyone seen um, the, oh, where's the debugger? There we go. That's, has anyone seen the video from absolutely ages ago of uh, someone showing off a new crazy IDE where they were programming Mario, they were programming Mario game and they made the level live and then they had Mario jump through and not quite make the jump and re-round the game and change the variables. So if I can find, oh, the bug is not on here, hang on a sec. So this is like pretty much a result of that. Um, he, it, this actually has a time traveling debugger in it, um, which is, oh, where's the Mario example? Which is absolutely crazy there is, okay. So just an example of what you can do with this sort of stuff. So uh, you can see the tiny little Mario down there, and I can run around as tiny little Mario, and I can jump and have a great time. And then later on, see up the corner, I'm capturing all the frames. I can rewind and go back over what I've just done. And now if I come here, and I say, for example, go for my code, and I find where gravity is defined. So gravity is defined here, and I were to change that to like a lesser value, like one, and then replay the, oh, I want that to be a higher value. Um, but 20, and then replay it, you'll see that my line changes, and as I replay that game again, as I click play, oh no, that wasn't what I wanted to do at all. Okay, cool, let's do that. So I do that jump, and then I change gravity, back to two, or four, and then rewind it, and go through that, and you see it's changed the whole execution, which is really cool. Um, and this language doesn't entirely have Haskell semantics, but it has Haskell syntax, and it has a lot of Haskell uh, principles in it. So, and this is meant entirely practically. Uh, it is worth saying that they removed monads in this and did some other abstraction. Um, but the point is, 
yes, it is researchy language, but there is real things being done with this knowledge. Um, check out Elm, really, really cool. So, obviously there was a little bit of code there, but I didn't really show how that works. So let's, let's have a look at some Haskell code. So, uh, let's just say that I'm going to define a function called main. So, the main thing about Haskell that tends to scare people is when they see that most Haskell code starts like this. So, in fact, let's start with a different function. Let's do, let's work on a function called add. So, this is a type signature, and to a lot of people who aren't used to uh, this style of programming, this looks immediately very scary. Um, but I've always kind of thought that a lot of that fear is um, just kind of silly. So if we actually look at how this works and how this is made, essentially what we're looking at there is a function add, which takes two parameters, well, which takes a parameter, in fact, I've made that, okay, <laughs> which takes two parameters, uh, a int x and an int y, and then just returns x plus y. So this is in a format called curried, well, currying, whatever you want to call it. So we're taking an argument, we're taking a second argument, and we're producing a result. What actually happens here is this is a function that takes our first argument, and then we expect the next argument, and then we turn our result. This arrow means a function from one thing to another. So we can call this function straight away by going add one, two, right? But if I were to actually just do, so if I were to quickly start up my interpreter, um, so yeah, I can do one plus two, right? But if I were to do one plus, hang on a sec. Uh, so if I do plus one, so I mean, that's right at the bottom, that's not very helpful for you. There you go, is that better? Cool. So let me start again. So when we've got plus, so I can do one plus two. But plus, uh, I can actually just do that at the front like this. So having it be like an operator is something you can define in Haskell by wrapping it in brackets. But if I put the brackets back in, it becomes a function, just normal functions. It takes us two arguments, so I can do that. So if I look at the type of plus, we see that I'm taking three A, well, I'm taking an A, an A, and I'm returning an A. That thing at the beginning, the num A, that basically says that uh, the variables, are the types I'm taking must be constrained to be a number. Um, so right now we're seeing something called parametric polymorphism, which I'll explain a bit in a bit. Um, but if I were to do just plus one and look at the type of that, we see that now my type parameter is shortened. I'm only expecting one A. So what's happening there is something called currying. I can take, uh, because an arrow is a function uh, from something to something. If I give just one of those somethings, I'm still expecting the next thing. So if I give a number, I'm still expecting, I'm st I then end up with a function that takes an A and returns an A. Um, so I can also code this more explicitly. Like if I were to do, um, for example, let add, uh, no, I should not do that in that one. If I were to do, if I take my add here and change that to be uh, int, to an int, to an int. Um, what I've done by putting that bracket in there is saying that my first argument is actually going to be a function itself. So I could do, I could pass a function in there without wrapping that in brackets, but this now more re explicitly restricts the type. Um, so let's talk a bit about parametric polymorphism. Uh, I always kind of forget to explain this because it's such a simple idea, and I'm always amazed when languages don't have it. Uh, it's otherwise called generics. Um, but if you're an object-oriented programmer, you're more used to seeing what's called inclusion polymorphism or subtyping. So obviously in object-oriented programming, uh, you would define a class. Say for example, we define animal. That would be a class, and then underneath that we would define uh, things that inherit from that class. We would define swan, we would define goat, whatever. Um, those are subtypes of that class, so they can be used wherever animal is accepted. Here we go a bit further than that. This is a function which works over anything that is constrained by certain types. So rather than having to say, um, well, constrained by certain uh, methods. So with, this, with these A's, once I instantiate that with an A, for example, if I were to do, oh, actually, it's interesting that didn't, hang on a sec. There we go. So if I were to, so when I just put one in there, 
it still is a type from A to A to A, well, A to A, because one can be any number of numeric types. That could be an int, that could be a float, that could be a double. If I restrict that one to the type of an integer, which is what I'm doing with those two colons, you see that the type class is now instantiated because I've taken that type variable, that A. So that A is like a variable in the type signature. I've taken that A and I've said, I want all A's that are used in this function, all types used in this function, to now be integers. So it restricts the types that I can have anywhere else. So if I were now, now to do that and then do 2.0, obviously we're going to get a huge, obvious, horrible type error. Um, at this point, I will go on a tangent and say, Haskell errors do immediately look awful, and you do just, that's just a thing you just, at some point they just click and they're no longer a problem. I don't know when that happened. I think I fell off a chair and hit my head in the textbook, but they're just now a thing you just read. Um, but you don't have to worry about that. So what, that's, what that error is um, basically saying is just that because I've passed my first argument in as an int, I've now restrained those further a's to int, and I can't now pass in a fractional, for example. So that's pretty cool. We can pass, we can curry, we can par do partial application, we can pass in arguments one at a time. So that's kind of the most basic bit of syntax everyone falls over. The next one is um, actually the way that these arguments are passed. So you'll see here that um, I don't have like this bracket at the top where I'm taking the parameters. I've got these two things on the left. So they look much more like mathematical equations. So I have my function name, and then any parameters I take come after that. So this can be really neat, because one of the things I can do here is I can, say, uh, is I can build up like cases just by doing pattern matching on the left. So I can say, for example, um, if I wanted to do some simple operations on the list, I say I just wanted to do like, I don't know, taking an element of a list and adding one to it. Let's just do some stupid map stuff. So I want to take a list of ints and get uh, back a list of ints. So obviously, like the first thing I'm going to do is if I get a list and there's nothing in that list, I don't want to like try and add one to it because I'm adding one to nothing. So I can do this really neat thing here where I pattern match on that. So you can actually, as well as specifying like a name or a variable for the operator, so for example, I could have a list x, I can actually also specify, uh, I can also pattern match over the shape of that data. So if I'm taking lists, um, which is what I've done here, this type, I've wrapped that up in a list. If I'm taking a list, one of the shape, one of the possible constructors for a list is an empty list. So I can just say here, do the empty list, and then I can just say, error, empty list. But then, obviously, later on, I might want to actually take that list and map plus one over it. So here I'm doing something which I would normally require an if to do, right? Like if I were to do have a function and I wanted to check whether the list was empty, I might have to actually compare. I might have to check whether, like, do if list is empty, do this or do this. But I'm doing it just in my definition. So I've reduced the length of code quite amazingly. And here's the next really neat thing. As I say, we can pattern match over shapes of data. So if you think about what a list is, a list is basically, um, so this is a data type definition. Oh, poo. A list is basically like, this isn't legit code, but a list is um, essentially uh, like has two operations. It has empty, and then it has like, a cons the rest of the list, right? So that was a really bad explanation. OK, so if we look at a list, so example, we've got uh, one, two, three. What that list actually is, is an empty list. And then we're concatting three to it. And then we're concatting two to it. And then we're concatting one to it. So this single colon is a list operation called cons or concat. So we just add the next one on. So there's two kind of constructors for list there. There's empty, like the end node. So if we were to do this as like a list of constructors, we'd have data list equals empty, um, data list a equals empty, or we'd have uh, node of a, yeah, node of list a, there we go, cool. Um, so it can either be something or it can be a container which would then have the next possible something in it. So if I want to pattern match on that, I can just say, OK, I've got an X. I've got a list X, or a list X's, more like. So I've got a list X's. I'm just going to call this variable X's. And I'm like, OK, I want to do something to the front element of that list. And I know that a list is a structure which is built up of 
taking a thing and adding something to the front of it. So I can actually pattern match on that. I can just say x cons x's. And when I do this, I can now just get the front element off. So I can say, like, OK, I want to just add 1 to the front element. So I can just go x plus 1 and then cons that back onto the rest of my list. That's pretty dope. It's pretty cool. And you can do this over any, any data type. So once you define a data type, so I kind of botched this explanation, you can define your own types by going like data, and then I can say, um, let's say data Joe, cool. Uh, and Joe is either talking or he's drinking. Perfect. So if I were to do a function which was like, if Joe, and I, it takes a Joe and it returns a bool, I can say, uh, if Joe uh, talking equals false, if Joe drinking equals true. And I've actually matched here over the constructors of my type. So you can define arbitrary complex structures and then pattern match on them in the function definition, removing whole classes of problems. You can remove if, you can remove cases, you can simplify your control flow of your programs really dramatically. And this is, becomes really effective if we're talking about recursive operations. So if I was to talk something about reversing a list, for example. So we've got an operation that takes a list of some things. Again, I'm using parametric polymorphism here, and we'll return a list of those things. But I want the operation to be reverse. I can take reverse list, and then for an empty list, we're just going to return the empty list, obvious. But then when we get into the actual list, so we're going to do that thing again. So I'm going to take the first element from my x's. Thank you very much. <coughs> See, this is what live coding is about. So I'm going to pattern match again over that structure. So I'm going to take the first element of my list of x's. I'm going to recursively call reverse list um, on those x's, and then I'm going to add that element I just had onto the end of it. Um, so this is another um, definition of concat. Uh, cons explicitly has to happen on a single element. So for example, say I had a list of numbers, uh, one, two, three. Uh, I could only cons one, two, two, and three. I couldn't do, for example, um, like two and three cons one. It has to be a single onto a list. But concat um, adds two lists together, so I just do that. So yeah, with this, this is a recursive definition. So I'm taking the top element off, I'm adding that back onto the end, and then I'm doing the same thing to the rest of the list. So that just reverses the list really simply, hopefully. I just, that may be wrong. I'm pretty sure that works. <laughs> and then I've specified the base case here. So if I hadn't done this base case, obviously this function would never end, and it would just, it would eventually error out because the list would be empty. But I've managed to encapsulate in that pattern matching. So this is all fun, and like doing this uh, matching on data is pretty neat, and it lets us do cool things with lists. But it also lets us do some really fun things with. Does it do any uh, tail call optimization? Oh yeah, yeah. So the Haskell compiler has tail call optimization. Um, it actually does an insane amount of uh, really crazy things. So one of the things I haven't really mentioned about Haskell um, is that it's lazy by default there is now an option in the compiler to turn that off because that's bad for certain things. So when we say lazy, um, basically it only evaluates when it needs to. So if I were in a traditional programming language and say I was doing like just some simple arithmetic operations, I was doing like one plus two um, plus well, times five. How that would work is it would do one plus two and get three and then multiply it by five. In Haskell, this is a slightly contrived example. In Haskell, it will see the 1 plus 2, and it will go, OK, that's not being used anyway yet. Let's leave that alone. We'll store that as what's called a func. So it just gets stored as that 1 plus 2 in some strange memory structure. And then it continues on down the expression. So it will go, OK, 1 plus 2, leave that alone. Ah, oh, times 5, OK. We still aren't actually using that. This does leave the 1 plus 2 where it is. And now we know that we're taking that func and multiplying that by 5. But we're not using that whole expression. So let's leave all that as a func as well. So let's just leave that whole thing alone and keep going. And then later on, when I say, um, no, I don't, yeah, when I say put strong lang, um, show, if that's quite an operation, um, this was a really bad example. So when I then output that to the screen, it will then go, oh, wait a minute, now he needs it. I should evaluate one plus two and then evaluate multiply that by five, um, which sounds a really stupid way of doing things. So obviously you're thinking, okay, so instead of 
resolving those uh, that expression and just tidying that away memory, I've now got this like growing list of funks kind of being stored somewhere. And you'd be completely right. Um, this does make it very hard to reason about your space requirements, which is the downside, which is why people want to force um, what we call strictness to remove laziness, because you have to be very careful about where your code is being lazy in case you blow up the RAM. What it does let you do is some really neat things. So say I had, uh, say I have a list of uh, 0 to 10,000. So this is another cool Haskell syntax thing. Uh, if I do 0 dot dot 10,000, that makes a list of 10,000 elements. Great. 100,000. I can't read. Do you know what time it is? Um, so yeah, that uses this. That's now a thing. In fact, I, this is just an interpreter. That'd be more fun. Cool. So if I do let x equals 1 to 10,000, cool. x is now a thing. So if I now want, say, the fifth element of x, Notice how quick that was? Didn't have to evaluate the whole list. Well, I mean, it's always going to be that quick. It's only 100,000 elements. Let's go, a bit, let's go a bit more drastic. Boom. Because it's lazy. So if I'm only asking for the six element, it doesn't need the other, all those elements. <laughs> um, it's, not even it's just going to get to six and go, cool. I don't even care what's passed here. I'm not going to try and work that out. I'm not going to do anything about that, which means I can start to do some really crazy things. So if I want to, for example, map uh, times, so if I want to, uh, so if you don't know what a map is, a uh, map is taking a function and applying that to every element in the data structure. So on the list, if I were to do map plus one and then x, it will go over that huge list of numbers and add one to everything. So I were to do map times 999 over everything in x, oh shit, and then evaluate it. So as you can see, this is still working quite quickly. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I don't know how to do that so I won't actually evaluate that. Oh, hang on, you study. Boom, there we go. Um, so <laughs> and now if I do y for six element, boom, I just get that out. Because it doesn't have to evaluate the whole list. I just did accidentally. So now that I have evaluated that stuff there up to that far, that will be uh, memoized and will be stored. So ha the compiler does a lot of these neat memorization tricks where um, once you have actually forced the evaluation of something, it will stay evaluated. And you know I've only got 10 minutes left, and I haven't even started talking about monads. Crap! So <laughs> monads, awesome. So let's talk about monads. So uh, monads are uh, the third thing in what's called uh, a category. So when we talk about a category, uh, I'm going to not use mathematical language. I'm using language that you all know. Um, we're essentially talking about objects with functions that map objects to other objects. So, I mean, a function is, in category language, they're called a morphism. And it's something which takes you from one category to, an, well, from one, what's this white word? It's group or structure. Takes you from one thing to another. So it's just a function. It takes you from one value, whatever, to another value. So when we look at some the, the, these things are built up in a hierarchy of power, right? So we start off at the most basic when we look at when we get functor. So a functor, again, these are all scary names. You could call this anything you want. Let's call this kittens. So we've got a functor, and we've got this isn't real Haskell now. It's just me doodling. Imagine I had a whiteboard. So we've got these kittens, and what kittens do is l when you've got an object which is a kitten, you can map over that object. Okay, I'm still calling kittens now. It's stupid. When you've got an object that is a functor, you can map over that object. So we've already seen one of those. We've seen the list. So a list is a data structure which is either empty or it's, again, this is all rubbish, or it's more list, right? Like it's either empty or it's got more things in it. Um, so we can, oh, I actually, you know what I can do? That would be a better idea. That's not, no. hmm. Ah, oh, oh, genius. So I'm just being really satisfied with myself now. So I anticipated not having correct internet, so I loaded up the Haskell docs. So if I go to control monad dot list, boom, cool. So no, that's all terrifying. Never mind. <laughs> so a list is either empty or it's taking a thing and concatting a thing onto it. So if we want to map over that list, um, basically what we're saying there is that we need to define a map operation for list. So we need there to be um, some instance of list where there exists an operation map that takes a 
a list of well, that takes a list of a's and a function from a to b, and it produces a list of b's. Is that clear? So we're taking our first parameter is a list of a's or a list of things. Let's do list. Thanks. Um, no, that's not right. Cool. List. We're taking a list of things. We're taking then a function which transforms a thing into a thing, and then we result in a list of those things because we apply that function to everything in that. So that's essentially a functor. So when we look at a functor, we look at a class called functor, where this map class exists that takes, uh, which takes a functor of a, an a, and an a to b, and produces a functor of b. So if we were to actually instantiate that for list, all we'd have to do is say that instance functor list, where, and then define map, right? So we just do the definition of map. So it's pretty much just an object. So we're just saying that there is a class functor, and list is a particular instantiation of functor that has this method. Great. So that's really simple. Functor is the most basic class we have in this hierarchy of classes called a category, called category theory, and it lets you map over things. That's perfect. But then we get into a problem. So let's say we have some other functor, not a list, but some functor, let's call it f, right? So we've got our functor f, and we then have another functor g. And so, interesting autocomplete there. And we want to, we've got these two things together, but we have an operation that takes an a and produces a b. Um, actually, no, let's not do this. Okay, so we have a, we have a functor of an a, and we want a functor of a b. That's not right either. No, that's not right either. OK, so the next one up is called applicative. So applicative is very similar to functor, but we get uh, a slightly different map function. We get uh, what's in Haskell syntax, this stupid syntax. So the fun thing about Haskell, which makes it impossible to read, is that we can't ever just call something a thing. We always have to make up these stupid operators. Um, so this one I like to call goatsy. Um, so we've, we have this special map we called fmap. And essentially that works the same as map, except the type signature for fmap is slightly convoluted, because instead of taking a functor of a thing and that a to b, we take a functor of a thing, and then we take a functor of an a to b, and then we end up with that f to b, I think. Let me check this. So applicative is, oddly enough, the only one I don't ever really use. Beautiful, cool. There we go. I don't know why I didn't do this in the first place. So it's this signature here. And the difference with this um, over just the mapping is that mapping works great when you are doing, um, when you're working on just one functor. So if I'm working on just one list, um, mapping sync across it works absolutely amazing. But if I want to map a function which takes a list, if I want to map a function which already has something containerized in it, in a functor in it, across another functor, we get into all sorts of problems. So this basically deals away with that. So I'm not going to go to applicative much because it's essentially just kind of a midway between what I want to talk about. But you'll see here, it says here sequential application. And sequential is one of the important bits. I heard someone say on the way into the room uh, the keyword programmable semicolon. So monads are sometimes called programmable semicolons because they let you sequence operations. Um, and that's what we're going to get onto now. So I do realize I completely fluffed that explanation of applicative. I don't care. So at this point, um, so we have functor, which has maps. We have applicative, which has fmap. But applicative also has another thing. So applicative works across things we've got in. You have to take science in a box. Uh, and apply that to two things in boxes, right? So if we want to do that on something that's not yet in a box, we need a way of getting that into a box. So we get this, up, we get this function called pure. And if we look at the type of pure, we find that it takes a thing and just puts it in our box. So our box is f, our box is an applicative. See here we've got this constraint, applicative f. So we just take any value. So if I were to go pure one, boom, I, oh, that wasn't very helpful. There you go. So if I do pure one, you find that 
the result of that is just a functor, an applicative functor of a one. So then I can do, um, I can start sequencing pure one with things and use that whenever I want to use applicative. So we end up with two methods there on our object. So the final one, monad, has three. So we still have our fmap, but it's called slight, something slightly strange. There is no agreed on name for monad, for this operation. Haskell calls it this. It's also been called bind, sequence, um, what else has it been called? Flat map. Any Scala is in the room? No, flat map's a big Scala thing. Um, it's called all sorts of things. The reason none of these names work is because of what these things actually are. So when we talk about function, we talk about applicative, we talk about monad, none of these operations, map, fmap, pure, have a obvious definition. They're defined on certain data structures, right? They're defined on lists, they're defined on option types, they're defined on whatever type you want to define. So flat map makes perfect sense if we're talking about a monad of a list. It doesn't necessarily make sense if we're talking about a monad of a tree, right? Like it just doesn't. So that's why they use this strange operator here. Um, we then also have the ones we've seen before. So we, we have pure, but we call that return now. This is the wor single worst mistake ever made in programming. Probably possibly worse than null, because it's nothing like return in imperative languages. It does the same thing as pure, so it takes something and puts it into a monad. Um, and we have one more, and I've forgotten what it is. It's the one that's really unimportant. So unimportant, it's not even in the monad laws. Cool, I'm going to ignore it then. Um, so, what does bind do? So bind is interesting. Are you kidding me? Perfect. Okay. So, let's look again at that operator. So when we talk about our applicative map, um, we're taking a function, which is a functor, taking a functor, and producing another functor from that. If we look at monad, and this operation that I'm going to call bind, but again, call it what you want. We're taking something that is containerized. So we're taking a list of A's, for example. We're then taking a function that takes an A and turns it into a B, but inside another container. And then we produce a list of B's. Uh, a Containered B. So that on its own doesn't really mean something. All that's telling you is that you have something in a container, then you have an operation that will get that thing out of that container and transform it in some way and package it back up, and then obviously you end up in the end with that thing. Where the magic happens in is what that method is often defined as. So why it's called bind and why it's called sequence is because these are used to sequence things. So if we look at an example of this, if we look at uh, IO, what's the time? Damn it. I spent too long talking about Haskell. So if you look at IO, um, so I'm using something called do syntax here. This simplifies it. So if I were to do do, I'd say, like, okay, do this get x. Um, I'm going to make x from 1. So return. Oh, that's time. Okay. So I set out to explain monads, and I didn't finish explaining monads. But do you now know about Haskell? Uh, okay, so I'm going to go sit out in the lobby. If anyone does want to finish learning about monads, we can do that. If not, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, again, I'm back at 4.20 with an actually prepared talk, which I've given loads of times before, and I promise you it's very good. So please come listen to that. Um, if anyone does want to talk to me about functional things and have me actually explain that, please come talk to me all day. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. On the way out, I've stuck two buttons on the wall. Uh, they currently don't work, but I will go fix them. If, uh, if on the way out you like this talk, press the like button. If you dislike it, press the dislike button. Have a great day.